Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rent Prep for Landlords. I'm your host, Eric Worrell, and this is episode 263. And we're going to be talking about a story coming out of Minneapolis where property owners and tenants are working together against bad policies. So we're going to get to that right after this. Welcome to the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. And now your hosts, Stephen White and Eric Worrell. So before we get to our featured news story, I thought I would uh, let you in on a little change that's happening in Oregon or Oregon, depending on where you're from. Uh, This came from the uh, Oregonian, uh, and the author is Elliot Nuss, and it's saying that uh, legislature bans landlords from using prior marijuana convictions to reject renters. So recreational marijuana, legal in Oregon, uh, but the uh, the Senate Bill 970 has a provision that says that marijuana provisions apply to all rentals across the state and that you cannot ban a tenant for prior marijuana convictions. Uh, the uh, bill passed with little discussion in either chamber after winning approval in the House last week. It next heads to Governor Kate Brown's desk for signing. It said that Senate Bill 420, very funny, which would allow Oregonians to set aside convictions for marijuana offenses that are no longer crimes, is headed for a final vote in the House this week. So I uh, just uh, thought I'd throw that in there in case you are either in a state that it's recreational or you happen to be in Oregon. Uh, they are now taking a look at prior convictions more and uh, creating provisions so that people aren't being penalized for that. In my opinion, it makes sense. I mean, if the thing's not a uh, law now and it's legal now, why are you going to deny somebody housing because of something that's legal you know, today. Um, I understand that it was illegal before and people have different uh, viewpoints on this, but uh, I think this is the right move. I understand some landlords might not like it, but to me, it's fine. To our featured story, uh, this one's pretty interesting. It comes out of Forbes.com. Uh, the author's name is Roger Valdez. And the title says that Minneapolis property owners and tenants work together against bad policies. I think this guy, Roger, is spot on with a lot of his articles. So I'm going to read a lot of it to you and kind of give some thoughts here. Uh, In the uh, opening paragraphs here, it says that can landlords and tenants work together to solve issues with rents and leases? Of course. So he says that he's a major advocate for landlords and tenants working together. And he said that it's happening right now as far as pushing back on bad policy and it's happening in Minneapolis. So Nicole uh, Beckstrand is the president of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association, MHA. And she's been working on a collaborative project called Safe Affordable Minneapolis. The efforts, which include uh, tenants, was put together to push back on a proposal by the Minneapolis City Council to ban the use of criminal background checks to screen tenants. A similar measure was passed in Seattle without much effect. So uh, (laughs) if you guys are familiar with the laws and the reportability of evictions and criminal reporting, uh, you might find this kind of crazy, but the ordinance uh, is pushing to disallow property owners from denying an application because of insufficient credit history credit scores lower than 500, and eviction judgments more than three years old. So when I read these three things, if you're not familiar with insufficient credit history, most of the time, that's usually a younger population. They just don't have enough credit on file yet to have credit history. But in this case, they are kind of focused on uh, people who are coming out of prison. So that might be a good case too, where you might have insufficient credit history and why they might be uh, focusing on that. But the one that really jumps out to me is that you cannot deny an applicant for having a credit score lower than a 500, which I think is ridiculous. And the idea behind it might be fine, but the execution is so incredibly flawed. So what I get out of that is that somebody who has a 501 credit score has a very good likelihood that they're not gonna get a rental. But if they had a 499 credit score, then it wouldn't have been able to even been considered So to me, that's such a weird rule to have that has so little thought put into it because why would you just randomly pick a, you know, 500, that sounds like a pretty even number. And you know what, if you're less than that, you can hide it. If it's more than that, well, you're gonna have to deal with your credit score. I think that one's ridiculous. Uh, As far as eviction judgments, more than three years old, currently eviction judgments are reportable for up to seven years. 
So uh, they're looking to shorten that window to three years. I mean, you can make an argument. Um, what we found, uh, and also from a transunion study, is that if you have two applicants side by side, one has a previous eviction and one does not, the person with the previous eviction is more than two and a half times more likely to be evicted again. So it's just a, uh, you know, an eviction on somebody's record is not a complete, you know, shut case. No, this person's never going to be a good runner again. But when you look at the data, uh, the data tells us that somebody with an eviction is much more likely to evict again. And then your average eviction can run you somewhere between two to $5,000, depending on what state you live in and how long it takes to go through the eviction process. So in this particular case, um, the insufficient credit history, I'm fine with. Uh, it's not a real big deal to me, but the credit score is lower than 500 and an eviction judgments uh, more than three years old. Uh, three years, it, it seems like a long time, but at the same time, if somebody was evicted for you know horrible behavior or not paying rent or whatever it was three years ago, I think that that's still kind of close enough that you would consider that uh, if you're comparing them to somebody else who's never been evicted. So uh, it's just kind of a, a goofy... Um, goofy rule. And maybe this is the art of negotiation where you just come out with really strong demands and then they kind of pull back and they go, okay, we'll do five years. <laughs> but I don't know what the, uh, the sentiment is behind the uh, housing association that's pushing for that. But the author here, like I said, he does a great job. And what I like is he's actually uh, worked in communities and he is a tenant advocate, but I feel like he has a really good view of both sides of the fence. He says that these proposals don't work to help tenants. He said, because anyone exiting the system already has huge barriers to housing, including bad credit, bad or no tenancy history, and very likely not much income. Simply eliminating the ability to screen for any of these things increases the risk for a private property owner. I always point out that the people wouldn't let a stranger borrow their car without asking questions like, do you have a driver's license? Uh, What will you leave me as a guarantee that you'll bring my car back in one piece? Offsetting that risk makes sense, and by removing the ability to screen the chances our deposits will rise and more stringent terms will be set on leases. That won't help anyone in a criminal background. So he brings up a really good point. So every time you have one of these rules that comes down, landlords are going to look at it and say, okay, well, I can't do that, but you know what? My security deposit just went from one month's rent to two months rent, or they're going to figure out other ways to protect themselves and protect their investments. So He says that what the MHA has found is that many existing tenants worry that they will be exposed to potentially dangerous people moving in without any background checks. We've covered this on a previous episode before where uh, somebody who uh, had a history of violence was in a uh, community and uh, actually uh, shot a police officer and shot himself and threatened a family. Uh, and the they were under fire that the property managers are there for not running a background check. So now you're trying to say, well, you can't run a background check because you can't consider those things. And I guess, you know, what this really boils down to is it's a really tough problem. And depending on where your values rest and what you kind of focus on uh, is going to determine what kind of which way you lean. So if you're somebody who is very... Um, uh, very big on reducing the uh, recidivism rate. So like how frequently people are going back to prison after leaving prison, you're of course going to side with some of these more stringent changes that are going to limit landlords. If you're a landlord, you're going to side typically with landlord pro laws and uh, rules. And it's difficult because the people making the rules, in my opinion, are interested in helping people. And then you have landlords who are interested in protecting their investments that they've worked so hard to build over time. So I see these stories over and over again, and it's always this combative kind of heads butting against each other. And it's because it's really tough. Like one side has to kind of give up a little bit for the other side to gain a little bit. But when you're talking about, you know, going to some landlord in Minneapolis who maybe has three rental units and he's poured his blood, sweat and tears into those units and he's put in those late nights, maybe, you know, painting walls and patching holes and uh, doing tenant turnovers and he's got a full time job and he's got a family and he's putting all of this work and effort into that. And then you're going to say that somebody's going to apply and you're going to say, well, their credit score is under 500. You can't even consider that on the uh, as a screening tool. And it's so ridiculous to me. But at the same time, I get it on the other end of the spectrum where you're trying to help a population 
to at least have the chance to succeed so they don't end up back on the streets or they don't end up in prison again and trying to fix it from that side. I'm not saying I have any answers for this, but it's interesting watching it play out. We watched it play out in Seattle where the city came down with uh, rulings that you can no longer use criminal background checks. And then the landlords of the town just came back in full force. And now it's been this back and forth with uh, you know, rules getting applied and then repealed. And it, to be honest, I'm not even sure where everything's at in Seattle anymore because it's changed so much. And you see this uh, rolling out in other areas and uh, it, it's difficult. It's very difficult to uh, figure out the solutions to these problems because everybody's got a vested interest. And I believe for the most part, people's hearts and minds are in the right place, uh, but you can't blame the landlord who's you know, got his blood, sweat, and tears locked into this uh, investment in his future for not wanting to protect that investment. So uh, really, really interesting, though, uh, coming out of Minneapolis. Uh, I'll be uh, definitely following that. Uh, and it says that uh, this guy, he's actually written previously as far as wanting to help people exiting the system as in the prisons. Um, he said that there's a program in Washington state that is aimed at supporting the transition of people leaving jail or prison called Early Release Voucher Program. And that program provides a three-month voucher to eligible people leaving the system. And uh, he was pushing to actually have that voucher increased in time frame, uh, but they haven't done that yet. And um, I don't know, I think uh, personally programs like that might be more successful than just trying to sweep things under the rug of saying like, no, that person doesn't have a past. We're not even going to let you consider it or see it or think about it. You need to just, you know, screen based on a very limited amount of details. Uh, that's very difficult to do. I think it's better to address the issue, find landlords who are willing to help that population uh, who are interested in that voucher program as well, and then create systems that allow people to help themselves so that they can get their feet back underneath them. And I know it's easier said than done. I mean, this is a massive problem and we've covered the incarceration rates before on this uh, program with the amount of people that are incarcerated in the US compared to the world population and how disproportionate it is. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's easy for someone like me just bitting out a podcast to kind of give his opinion, but it's very tough to do these things. So uh, it's good that people are trying to work forward towards a solution. So I'll link to the article, the full article from Roger. Like I said, I thought it was a really thoughtful piece, uh, very well done. And I think he does a great job of advocating for both landlords and tenants and has some interesting ideas that you don't see too much out there uh, where it usually is just somebody, you know, thumping their chest for their side and then saying the other side's completely wrong. I think he does a great job of uh, looking at both sides and uh, wearing both shoes, so to speak. So uh, yeah, check that out. And uh, yeah, that's it for this week, guys. Until next week, have a great week and take care. Bye.